using an approach of token taxonomy as your regulatory framework just does not value the work that's being done by a community like the Ethereum or you know other communities are as well, which I'm unfortunately less familiar with, but I know that there's other work going on in other communities. Welcome to Grokchain Conversations. This podcast is presented by a multidisciplinary group of legal, financial, and technology professionals to meet and discuss today's most pressing questions around the use and governance of the blockchain. Through roundtable dialogue, we will provide listeners with a full spectrum of views on where this technology is today and where it might be leading. The information provided on the Grokchain Conversations is for educational purposes only. The information provided does not constitute legal, investment, financial, tax, accounting, or any other professionally licensed advice. The views expressed here are those of the individuals, not those of their respective employers or grok chain. Today's topic, pitfalls of legislating and or regulating by token taxonomy. With participants, Alessandro Daliana and Martin Warner. Welcome, Martin. Usually, uh, Chris Ott is the one who's the, our mediator, uh, but he's taking care of his children this week and cannot participate. So I'm filling in for him. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. So today's conversation has to do with token taxonomy, in particular, how certain regulators or legislators uh, are, eh, I'm going to say even lawyers, throw them into the pot, uh, tend to look at this uh, industry and evaluate it in terms of token taxonomy and not in terms of control or centralization and decentralization, i.e. networks that provide their own uh, fault tolerance or their own security as opposed to those that do not. Um, we, I think from our previous conversations, I think we see pretty much eye to eye on this subject, but for our listeners, I think it's good that we uh, delve into the subject. So if you'd like to share your initial thoughts with them, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I think um, the term token is widely misunderstood by many people. Um, there are many flavors of tokens and a catch-all crypto tokens are this, that, and the other. It really isn't helpful in the in the whole debate, especially when you start diving into taxonomy. And at its broadest level, we kind of understand there's the, I suppose, commodity currency type token like Bitcoin, Ethereum that um, been around for ages. They're fully decentralized, and um, they use to buy and sell things, um, often a store of value. Then you have utility tokens, which are quite important for proof of stake um, systems, as in that's the, the token used to secure the network and people don't always appreciate that. It's seen as a speculation token or whatever it is, but it's a, it's a core part of maintaining a proof of stake token or proof of stake network because you're creating scarcity in the token to secure your network. Then you have a whole myriad of NFTs, um, and that is a taxonomy in its own right. And then finally, the strange kind of security tokens um, that kind of emerge but haven't really gone anywhere. So I think we've got quite a spectrum to talk about today. Yeah, you see, I'd use a different taxonomy. Close, but different. So I'd have fungible. Okay. So that's your Bitcoin slash utility token or Ethereum utility token. Um, as opposed to you who separate the two, the, uh, but you can, and those networks are networks that provide their own level of security. And the token actually has nothing to do with the, or very little to do with the level of security that those networks have, i.e. here in the U S the regulators have considered those to be utility tokens because it's what you use on the network to pay for the services of the network 
but you don't actually need them to get the security. Proof of stake, yes, I agree. It's a little different, but I'm talking proof of work for the moment. Um, you, I agree with you, we have security tokens, which are basically any security instruments that you could, that a government or company could issue that's tokenized. So they could be shares, they could be bonds, they could be all sorts of fun financial instruments or dangerous financial instruments. Uh, and then the NFTs, which are the non-fungible tokens, which uh, you could use from for anything from your bored apes to, I don't know, if you, if you really wanted to, you could take the, the serial number on a bill and turn it into an NFT. And or indeed say, okay, this podcast, this podcast as well could be, yeah. True, anything that, uh, but it serves a completely different purpose than a non-fungible token. Where, where do you see the, um, like the, what do you call it, the fractional NFTs? So this is where people are splitting up NFTs and, and being able to part own some of them. That's kind of some regulators looking at saying these look a little bit like securities now. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't look at NFTs as anything of any value, they shouldn't really exist because they don't really serve any purpose except to, uh, how should I put it? They're an end user case. You know, the, probably I think the, the most important insight for me at one point was understanding that you don't need Bitcoin or Ethereum to get the security that the network gives you. It's part of the token itself is part of an incentive mechanism to, well, in the case of Bitcoin, to actually grow the network, to get people to make those investments uh, in computing equipment, so it's more of a subsidy that goes down in time until such a point that it completely disappears. And then the idea is that Bitcoin is then normalized in its use and you don't have all those price fluctuations, but the security is still the same level of security that you have today, provided that software doesn't evolve. The, the game theoretic security that uh, we talk about. Whereas, NFTs, I don't really see them incentivizing production in any way. It's more incentivizing use. Yep, that's a good way of looking at it. Definitely. I, in a previous blockchain call that we uh, conversation we had um, with some other participants, like, is the NFT the file you got at the end, the coin or the, the, the token you've got it, or is it the smart contract? For me, it's a smart contract. It's not the token. It's not even the image that's you know, serialized into the token, but it's the actual contract and what the contract does, the smart contract. Yeah. So there, there was a, quite a bit of debate about that. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll see these evolve because, um, you know, the, the basic offering is just like you say, it's it's a object serialized on chain or it's linked to a path to something else. And um, but then there was never really a clear idea of what you're actually buying. So the whole licensing copyright, whether it's copy left or whether it's copyright, that will, I think, start to become more and more important about what do you actually own and what can you do with this thing? There's one thing owning an ape, but that's, does that give you the right to go and mint a load of t-shirts and distribute as key fobs and, and, you know, create artwork around it? Or is it just the right to that ape in the form of a smart contract? 
while having dabbled a while in internet in, in licensing agreements for IP, you know, mm -hmm. you can get pretty damn creative with that stuff. It's like, okay, you know, I'm giving you a right to use this intellectual property for this specific purpose and this specific market and this specific geography. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you, you can really, you know, get down into a very, very uh, tightly defined uh, use case. Mm -hmm. uh, then, and then you get into you know all the sub licensing stuff, and you know, that's a whole another thing that you can throw in there. But uh, yeah, licensing agreements are kind of fun for that particular mm -hmm. reason. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's get back to our token taxonomy di discussion because we we do have the fungible token tokens, non-fungible tokens. We have the uh, security tokens, but we also have these nasty little creatures called asset back tokens, which are kind of like the security tokens, but not really because it's off chain. Now, if I'm doing a security token, I can say, you know, I'm minting whatever, you know, 5 million shares of this particular company and they're all on, this, on the chain and that's fine. But when we start looking at things like uh, Tether, that's probably the most controversial one or you know, even some other uh, stable coins. You know, we're Ooh. talking about things that are off chain and that's kind of where they cross with NFTs because sometimes the NFT what it's connected with is off chain because the file is in you know some someone's server someone's whatever as opposed to being in the ipfs basically on classic ones of course the classic one of course is a real estate one that we've seen you know your spv that's tokenized and put on chain you're not actually owning anything Right. You own a share of the SPV, which in turn owns the hotel, the vineyard, whatever it else has been tokenized. Right. Scotch. That gets interesting. Scotch is the good one. I looked into yeah. that one. <laughs> uh, but yes, wine. Uh, there's also the case, I think I heard, but I'm not sure about this. A Klimt was tokenized, a painting by Klimt. Uh, that rings a bell, yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. So yeah, these are the asset-backed things that you know are off chain and you know they they really have nothing you know they're again you know you're looking at an end use case as opposed to an actual mm, a, a, a crypto sorry a game theoretically guaranteed secure within parameters network mm -hmm. So it's a very different animal. And I fear that the, uh, some of the legislators and regulators are using, and lawyers, sorry, I got to throw them in there because you know, I've heard lots of discussions with lawyers and I'm like, you know, I put up my hand to ask a question like, but what about the decentralized or distributed models? And they don't even know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, that's, but that's what the innovation was with Bitcoin, was that it's, it is something that's a distributed computing network. It is something that you know, is censorship resistant. It is something that provides its own uh, regulation, its own rate of production, its own uh, self-correcting mechanisms, which makes it supposedly autonomous within certain parameters but it's self-secure within parameters. Uh, and you know, to me, those types of networks, I would not want to see them regulated. I would not want to see them uh, come under the influence of a government because it might actually be putting thumb, a thumb on the scale and put the whole system out of whack. Mm. Yeah, that, that resonates a lot with the utility tokens. They have strong utility for, you know, 
for the basics, it's the anti-spam from the transaction fees and for proof of stake. So of course, securing the network. And if that was suddenly to become, you can only use them through centralized platforms where you have to ID and everything, then you break the system effectively. Yeah, I mean, the KYC AML part, it's kind of bothersome, but you know, I don't know if it will break the system per se, as long as those points of centralization are not able to influence the market. Well, let's, let's look at it. Maybe it's an edge case, but if you look at proof of stake, mm -hmm. if you centralize people through driving them away from what the Europeans are calling unhosted wallets into centralized exchanges, what you then see is these centralized exchanges, they provide staking services. So you think, great, I get my 7% return on a respectable chain. Very nice. They stake on my behalf and a bunch of their other customers. But actually, you don't really have that voting right or choice of which particular validator you want to stake with. That's the decision of the centralized exchange. And then you start looking at the top 10 validators of a large proof of stake network. And it could easily be that it's Binance, it's Coinbase, it's Kraken, it's Bitstamp, whatever, who then have the voting decisions on those chains. Do we upgrade the software? Do we do something else? Do we take a decision here? And that's concentrating the voting into a very opaque way and that's not particularly regulated and that has material impact on how the chains run so it's much better if you're using delegated proof of stake that the delegation is done directly with the control and you can swap between validators or you can spread across different validators if you're worried about slashing in any particular one and the reputation management and so on of the validators becomes more and more important so i think if you heavy-handedly say things like unhosted wallets bad and you're wanting to get a you know stake of tokens to secure a network you believe in and get a yield from it that's really not i think the realm of regulators to jump in too much there well i hear two different things from what you're saying so i'm going to ask you to clarify okay is it delegated proof of stake bad as opposed to straight proof of stake or is it unhosted wallets versus hosted wallets that's bad? I mean, there's an argument for both, okay? But from what yeah. you were saying, it wasn't clear which one was which, what so, your position was. I think, yeah, delegated proof of stake is, is a very problematic one for me. Yes, um, I agree with that. <laughs> okay. So let's start off. There's a whole list, and I'll go through them because I think it's important to... to just sort of throw these ideas around, maybe discuss them in the context of how you secure a network. So the first well, point also, is- hold, hold on, hold on. Just for our listeners, our viewers, uh, maybe you should say that you're working with T-Grade and you're, you yeah. have a delegate, you have a proof of stake system. So we do, and we've taken a very conscious decision not to have delegated proof of stake. So I will put my cards out there. Um, okay. And we've made adaptions to that. So the reasoning for the, for questioning the delegated proof of stake, it was a long process back and forth and looking at what's the plus, what's the minus and so on. And it's come down to a, a number of things. So we're, we're peculiar because we want to bridge the regulated side of things. And um, we, we've consciously designed the entire network from the ground up to be regulatory friendly. So one of the, one of the aspects of delegated proof of stake is and this is, this is probably not at all accurate, but this is how it could be perceived. So let's imagine you're a half-informed expert looking at blockchain, and you see an entity, an institution, or whatever you call it, an actor, who's receiving deposits from a large number of people, and managing those deposits and giving them a return. An a rate of interest on that. Doesn't that sound a lot like a bank? It does indeed. So from that point of view, from a pure, how do we look at this? How is it perceived? That was one 
negative point. Even though it's not strictly true, we don't receive those deposits in and then fractalize. That's what banks do. But obviously, as a validator, you don't. You're just using the tokens to so you build your stake. Not yet. Who was? Not yet. Exactly. <laughs> well, until you start looking at liquid staking. Yeah, but that's another <laughs> thing. <laughs> so that was the first point. The second one is um, delegators should, in theory, do full research and all the validators in the network to look at the reputable ones to see you know which one's good which one's trying which ones you know do your research in practice people tend to just go to the biggest ones so the concentration that way i'm going to the winning side i'm just going to pop it in there or the one that gives me zero commission doesn't charge me any commission for doing it because they're quite well funded they don't need to earn off my stake they can do it anyway or they're front running so, my my transactions and making money that way yeah. whatever yeah so that that to me is it's problematic because again that can lead to concentrations of power in validators because it's the herd mentality and the, and the, and the delegators aren't necessarily doing their own job secondly or thirdly should i say there's also a risk around the slashing events so let's say i'm a, a half reasonable um, outfit that can run a data center sensibly. I have my DevOps guys, pretty good coverage and all my hot backups and everything managed. Um, and for some reason, we make a small mistake and we run up our backup by mistake, we end up double signing something. We'll automatically get slashed for that. So I've made a mistake there. I've got all these delegators with their tokens. Who gets punished? Not much skin off my nose. Whoops, they get punished. But the only reason I really care as a validator is reputation damage. You know, I don't want to get slashed too often because these guys will walk their feet. They'll unbond and off they go to the next one, in which case my business collapses. So if you look at the size of stakes, they, yeah, they will take a view of maybe I'll just pay this fine because it's not a well, huge material yeah. cost and I'll keep the reputation safe. Um, don't you also have another problem with uh, who gets to mine the next block when not every delegator has the same stake? Yeah, it's to do with the, voting authority. The bigger the yeah, stake, the more the, often you get done. Yeah. Hmm. Well, depending on how it's programmed. Correct. You know, yeah. That can that can also, you know, put a thumb on the scale that you don't want to put on the scale. Mm -hmm. Or at least as a regulator, you would not want to see someone putting their thumbs on the scale, whether it's a stake, a, 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 whoever it is, including yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that you know, broadly, there's quite a few different issues. So the proposal that, that I mean, we, we, what we're doing is, is saying we have proof of stake. Now, if you're validating and you're like good at DevOps, but you're not particularly well bankrolled, there is another way to do this to say, okay, so I'm going to offer something where you lend me your tokens for a five year period. I'll give you this much return on it. And I will personally use those for staking. I'll get a return. I'll take a cut for running the thing and I'll pay it back at the end and return your coins when it's finished. Or you can opt to roll over again. That's another way of doing it. But then you take all the risk yourself as a validator. And well, therefore, well, you're still not doing you're not doing the work at the end of the day you're just putting up the stake and someone else is doing the work and but you're, you're assuming the whatever the risks are that the validator is doing the job properly yeah i mean you're getting reward for that but the validator then is person responsible for returning those coins that's the or, difference but you know yes you know is the reward commensurate with the risk absolutely and that's for the commercials to figure out yeah, but it's you, know, you. You might be an expert, fairly well informed, just enough to get yourself into trouble, type person, <laughs> and think that you know you, the validator is good, but you know it's a good bet, but he's not actually a good bet. He yeah, or, or you could have they, the the rug pull one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, so then there's the aspect of. Um, a hosted as opposed to unhosted wallets. Yeah. Which I think you were touching on before, which is a little bit of a side discussion to token taxonomy. So I don't know. It is, but I think it's an important. I'll briefly go into it because I think it's very sure. important. Okay. Um, 
I think the word wallet is very misleading in, in crypto. A wallet, when you think about it at a very abstract level, is, is two pieces of, of leather or lorica, if you're that way inclined, sewn together. And it's your mini ledger where you hold your cash. And only you know what the balance is in that wallet. When you walk around with it in your back pocket, nobody else has a clue whether you're carrying 300 bucks or 10 bucks or none. You just have your cards in there, or if, even if you have your wallet with you. See, that's your business. Now, a crypto wallet doesn't have a balance in its own right because you're dealing with the public immutable ledger. So you're not holding anything in the same way as a wallet as you would um, a leather or a Lorica wallet. So what you are doing with a wallet, a crypto wallet, is you're using it to sign transactions and manage your keys. And I think it's a very different idea, especially when you get into discussions about money laundering. So the, the wisdom of the half-informed, again, being rude about them, is they say, ah, a wallet, you can hide cash from there from illicit gains, but you can't. It's completely transparent. It's not like your greasy wallet that's full of used 50 notes where you can hide all the proceeds of crime. It's a very different thing. And so the scaremongering around the unhosted wallet, I think, is misfounded. I think if you use it purely for the, as a signing tool and managing your keys, that's OK. I have to say I agree with you there. Uh... However, I did, I did used to look at a wallet more as I can have different tokens in there. So it's not just a 50 or $100 bill. It's I can have yen, and euros, and pounds, and whatever. Yeah. But you know, they're all on the network. And they're all different signature keys that I'm using. Absolutely, uh, yeah. To, to operate them. But you know, if somebody goes to look at my Ethereum address, you know, there are going to be a whole bunch of different tokens in there. Yeah, and you could be up on, on the Whale Watch site if you're big enough. Not yet. Maybe one day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So let's go back to our token taxonomy and the, uh, the risks that our friends in the, uh, we'll call them the legal arena, are, as far as I would like to say, are not seen uh, by using this you know, one size fits all approach. Uh, if we go back to our basic fungible token, you can have a fungible token that works on a centralized network, like you can have one that works on a distributed network. So legislating or regulating on the basis of fungible tokens does not allow the regulator to uh, appreciate the risk, the risks that exist on these two different types and whatever, whatever there is in between the, uh, networks. And consequently, they risk making some serious mistakes, over-regulating in some cases and under-regulating in another. What happens if you looked at your basic fungible utility token as a multi-use voucher, like a phone card? What kind of regulation would be appropriate for that? As a multi-use phone card? Hmm. I'll have to think about that one. I guess you have, because it doesn't sound innocuous. So please tell us. <laughs> so if you think like a, a multi-use phone card, you can top it up through your app. You have this card, you stick it into the, the phone machine in the olden days before smartphones and everything. You made your call, then you got some beeps you're running out, you went and got some more credit on it, and you kept reusing this card, adding up tokens. You, well, not tokens, you built your balance up, you used it on the same system. These cards are only valid in that phone network, not for anything else. You couldn't use it for anything else at all but it was just a card you carried around to be able to make phone calls when you needed in, in the given network. And that is, I think, the best way to look at a utility token. I have a token. I use it for my transactions. I might need it for escrow. 
and a validator will earn tokens and they will sell them to pay for the running cost of their data center and that gets recirculated because somebody else wants to buy them and that's how you get the same token being recycled in the same way a phone company would issue the credits debit them when you use them for the phone calls and so on that's i think a fairly similar system well, that would be consistent, at least with the U.S. view that utility tokens are for paying for an underlying service. And in and of themselves, you give them whatever value you want to give them. It's, you know, it's market determined, Yeah, uh, which is fine. Um, but what you can't prevent, the, I guess, is speculation. People get hold of these and say, oh, they're now declared priceless sure but you know that's if that's what the market wants to value them at you know that's what the market values them at you now it's like mm -hmm. the meme stocks you yeah. know, i used to own GameStop, and i certainly sold it off at a you know a very low price <laughs> compared to where it went to you know, like well, this company is not worth this amount of money at least not to me but i guess it was that worth a lot of more money to other people yeah. Um, whether that was justified or not, whether that made any kind of economic sense or not, um, it's not really for me to say. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, someone's gonna someone's gonna lose money somewhere when you have a mispricing of the assets. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that's true of everything. You know, you can. I once got a new car and went to the gas station to fill up the tank and the, the gas station attendant said, your windshield wipers are no good. You should change them. I'm like, but it's a new car. <laughs> How is it possible that they're not good anymore? They seem to be working just fine. But, you know, he wanted to sell windshield wipers. Uh, you know, then whether it was the actual, you know, the price for the windshield wipers was a market price or above market price. Who knew? But anyway, I did not buy the windshield wipers. They came free with the car you bought. Well, they were just, you know, the car was new. So exactly. <laughs> there was no point. Yeah. yeah. Pe you know, people will try to sell you something if they can. You know, buyer beware, Correct. I guess, is the old adage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the I think this probably brings us to the to the asset backed tokens, mm -hmm. um, which can be NFTs. They can be fungible or non fungible, I guess. So tether being a non fungible, uh, sorry, a fungible, and some image or a podcast or whatever being non fungible. Um, essentially off chain or to use the industry language, non-deterministic uh, mm -hmm. assets. Yeah. Uh, deterministic being anything that's, any information that's actually on the network itself, as opposed to something that's off the network. Uh, language is very important in this industry. So I, I try to be as specific as possible. <laughs> even though I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. There's a question for you. Would asset-backed or much more widespread use of asset-backed tokens, as in representing real-world assets, bring a much bigger adoption to blockchain? Um, so it's my understanding that blockchains really stink as databases you don't want to have a database bloat because it just slows down the network completely so based on that understanding alone i would say probably not um i think with regard to use cases um no, it's email. 
sending you an email that instead of being, you know, blah, 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 or a picture or something attached to it, it's an email that says, you know, I owe you, uh, or I'm paying you, you know, X amount of money. And, you know, once you've gotten that money, you get rid of the email, <laughs> you just don't need to keep it anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that that's probably more the case if it's a distributed network because of the security issues that you have with the replication of the database. And if you, if you were to have a whole bunch of real world assets on chain, I think you'd probably do it on a centralized system or at least a permissioned and you know, lesser, less number of nodes, less number of copies. Um, going on. I think back in the, I don't know if it's still the case, but the Australian Stock Exchange was working with this, uh, with this technology, but they had three nodes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they had a leader node or not, but you know, that, 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 you know in, in very uh, layman's terms, um, these, it's about database replication. You know, how many copies of a database can I make without having human participation, human interference? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you do think very carefully about what is stored on chain, and mm -hmm. quite often it'll just be a hash representation of something that's stored elsewhere. And so that's the way to reduce that. But then you're creating something off chain that is, isn't as verifiable and the trust issues then come in. Um, well, unless it's on another chain, like you know, Filecoin gives you yeah. Yeah, IPFS, mm -hmm. then you have a higher level of security. But you know, what, always, what always confuses me because I'm not a technologist is yeah, I can have a hash of something and I can you know, say it's you know, X number of bits long. And, but all I have to do is like change one bit of whatever it is I'm hashing and I'm gonna get a different hash. Correct. Yeah. So what happens to the, you know, my JPEG file, even if it's, if it's stored in IPFS, you know, all I have to do is have like one, one digit that changes and the hash is completely different. and. You know, all, you know, Gone. I, yeah. I, I just don't own it anymore. So it's a pretty strong incentive not to change the hash or not to change the, the artifact. Yeah, you can't change the artifact, but you know, mm. we know that, that it happens, you know, whether it's on your computer or on the network or you know, in yeah. the cloud or something, you know, one little, you know, one little bit can switch from zero to one. Yeah, you can, uh, and you know that's without somebody actually going in and manipulating. It's just you know, it just happens. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. So how how are asset backed tokens defined then, from a legalistic point of view? Uh, I don't think they're defined legally. I think that they're a asset that has evolved because people people want people who were doing a lot of trading online didn't have a ready off ramp so mm -hmm. they created this way that you can you know, realize your capital gain or capital loss and you know go from whatever you know bitcoin ethereum whatever into a stable coin but there again, you know, you end up with a situation where you're behaving a bit like a bank. Does the bank have enough liquidity, enough reserves to satisfy everybody's tether? And that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, probably more than a million, but yeah. <laughs> Just for starters. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well. You know, there and you know you, you have to look at you know what particular point in time you know do you have enough reserves uh, to satisfy all of those obligations whereas with die you know it's it's over collateralized so 
you're okay. Well, that's where we, you know, that's where once again, the, the regulator is not necessarily making a distinction between something that's, we'll call it centralized with something that's decentralized. Mm. Yes, die, you're always fine. And, you know, when the collateralization goes down too far, it just automatically liquidates and you know, takes your assets and you know, that's it. You know, yep. It resolves itself. It's a programmatically, it's a programmatic stable coin. Whereas Tether, USDT, or uh, USDC, which is done through a consortium with Circle, I think Coinbase is in it. Anyway, there are a number of uh, large players who are basically self-insuring the market through a consortium. You know you need to have some kind of oversight because yeah. that's just the way it is. You, have to, you can't necessarily trust someone's representations. You have to go in and check them periodically. Bit, bit like subprime mortgages. Yeah, well, a bit like. In Tether's case, yes. USDC, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's the, uh, you know, we, we didn't even mention the use of these tokens, regardless of whether they're fungible, non-fungible, or asset-backed, or security tokens. Uh, uh, with DeFi, or TradFi, or CFi, or whatever, you know, you're, you're, you're using these tokens that may actually have value or may not actually have value in these other marketplaces. So you're basically multiplying the risk. And you know, I'm not even gonna get into the on-chain, off-chain stuff, because once you know, we start looking at Coinbase or Binance or whatever, and the transactions that they're doing that are not recorded on-chain, you know, it's because you're, you're, you're multiplying all those risks even further. Yeah, and it's interesting as well that um, I think Gary Gensler was talking about this, about looking at centralized exchanges, saying, well, are they trading on their own behalf? We don't know. Should they segregate their customer stuff? Should they have separate custody? Should they look more like traditional institutions rather than this where a centralized exchange trusts us? Right, but we already have a whole history of regulations that deal with that for regular traditional financial mm. institutions. Yeah. It's just a question of, you know, do you extend it to these exchanges or not? Mm -hmm. But you know, if you, you know, if you look at something like Bitcoin that I think does four transactions or seven transactions per second or something. And you mm -hmm. look at a company like Binance and all of the trading that goes on there with Bitcoin, you know, it's, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's faster than four or whatever, seven transactions per second. You know, so and you don't have to wait not, 20 minutes of finality. Well, that's another story, but at least you, you've got something on chain. Correct. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think Coinbase is a little bit better because you actually have an address. You actually have a a wallet, a Bitcoin wallet, so you mm -hmm. you, you can receive and send from a particular um, address. That's yours, even though you don't own the keys. Yeah, which is problematic. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the defense of those companies is they've made adoption and life easy for many people it looks a familiar interface you log in you use put fiat on fiat off you can trade it's all very convenient uh having used them myself fairly recently i will tell you they are anything but convenient they're terrible and they cost a bloody fortune well yeah i right. won't even go into that <laughs> I, I opened up an account with Gemini. 
I'm an American in New York working with a New York company with a New York bank and they treat my transactions as international. So I get all these international fees. And when I say to them, I'm sorry, but you know, why are you guys sending this stuff to London? Why is it in it? I was like, this, you're an American company. <laughs> and I was, they didn't want it. They didn't even answer me. So I just closed the account with them, mm -hmm. but it was, it was bloody expensive. Yeah. Anyway, that's aside the point. It's got nothing to do with today's discussion. Taxonomy, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, uh, I, you know, to go back to the hosted, unhosted wallet issue, you know, I think with time, as the user interface improves, you know, beyond MetaMask, I hope, um, mm -hmm. there won't be any reason for these centralized exchanges. You know, it'll just be, you know, it'll be as easy as sending an email. You know, here's a, here's a payment for whatever, you know, mm -hmm. that's it. I send you an email. Now, maybe it's, you know, maybe they're even connected one to the other. You know, I can send you a Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever payment in the body of my email. And, you know, I don't even have to do anything. I have to think about it. Yeah. Now there's definitely challenges on the usability side of things, but, um, yeah, it's probably another topic of another podcast that I think we'd, probably, we'd need it well, uh, well over an hour to talk about that one. Well, you know, you and I are old enough to remember when the internet started and there were usability <laughs> problems back then too. You could say uh, that, yeah. This is just, uh, <laughs> this is just yeah, I guess part of, the, part of the growing things. It's also priorities, you know, there's fun things to do and yeah, usability at the moment isn't one of those. Well, scalability is the is the key one. Yeah, and you know, mm -hmm. scaling on a distributed network is problematic. It's an actual technological challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to give credit to the Ethereum community for having developed layer two uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. We still don't know what's going to happen with the merge. It looks like everything's going to work out well, but you know, once it moves to proof of stake, there's going to be, a, I think, uh, I don't want to say something stupid, but like a two or three X improvement in throughput. Well, more than that. Yeah, more than that. Really? I yeah. thought they were going from, I don't know why I thought they were going from like 14 transactions to per, per second to 32. Well, maybe I'm wrong there. I thought it was more, more gains than that. It might stage. be more. It might be more. Yeah. I don't know. I, mm -hmm. But I know that they're very dedicated to maintaining the dis distributed computing network for you know, being able to have this computing network, computer in the cloud, if you like, the world computer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very ambitious what they're doing with the sharding and uh, you know, the beacon layer and everything. It's, it's very admirable. I think it's a good thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the, the real certainty is whatever it is, it will get delayed because it's so ambitious. Well, it's just bloody hard. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, you know, when I look at this technology, not being a technologist, and they're like, well, you know, I can run the chain on, you know, one of the CPUs on the, my uh, multi-core processor, but I can't run it on all the cores at the same time because it becomes asynchronous. And when I'm running a smart contract, I got to stop and wait for the, you know, the solution to come from another chain. And, Oh yeah, okay. I can see how this is really bloody hard. <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely. Even me, who yeah. doesn't understand this technology, you know, it's like okay, I can understand there are eight cores on my processor, you know, on my CPU, and you know, well, only one of them is working properly. It's like, yeah, how many cylinders do you have in my car? Only one's running. It makes it all makes it very difficult to get the car to move to turn the crank. Exactly. Out. Yeah. But uh, no, it's brilliant. If they're able to succeed, it's a bloody brilliant thing. They will. It'll just take time. Sure, sure. Mm. Then I will be on the whale list once they've gotten up to that point, because then my ETH will be worth a lot of money. <laughs> yeah.
mine okay. and everybody else's. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, once again, I think that is where token using an approach of token taxonomy as your regulatory framework just does not value the work that's being done by a community like the Ethereum community. Or, you know, other communities are as well, which I'm unfortunately less familiar with, but I know that there's other work going on in other communities. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not to take anything away from them, please. Nobody start yelling at me, sending me nasty emails and stuff. But, uh, you know, the, the regulator, I think, has to, and the legislator have to take this into consideration. Not only because it makes sense, not only because of the different risk, risk levels, not only because of even the proximity to the user, <clears throat> but also because of these networks are censorship resistant. So whatever it is that you're planning to do with them, you just can't. <laughs> so you gotta be, you, know, you gotta be aware of it. So what, what is the right point for the regulators? What, what do you think are the top three things they should do when they're looking at these? Um, well, I think the, the first thing is to realize or to understand that there was an innovation that happened over 10 years ago with Bitcoin that allowed mm-hmm. there to be the development of this distributed computing system network that has all sorts of properties. And unless you understand how that system developed and then you know, evolved slowly into Ethereum and to you know, uh, even Definity with you know, some other projects, Polkadot, um, where you, you actually have software that controls the pace of production such that the, the whatever, whatever discrepancies exist in the replication of the database get corrected. So it's self-regulating, self-healing, self-managed system, um, which provides a certain risk profile. And once again, for me, the big discovery was you don't need Bitcoin. You don't need the token to get those security guarantees. <laughs> you know, it's something, it's, it's math, apparently. Math, I don't understand, but it's math. Um, you, know, you, you have to have that clear dividing line, I think, which requires you to understand what the innovation is. And then once you've understood what the innovation is, then you can start delving into the risks associated with this new type of technology, as you were mentioning with proof of stake, whether it's delegated or not delegated. Same thing with the wallets, whether they're hosted or unhosted wallets, whether you know how much money I have in my billfold or not, and what I have and so on. I suppose you the know, biggest then, challenge here is, is how do we communicate this in a really clear way to politicians? Because they're the guys that are jumping in as the best policymakers in the world who could have the best understanding with the best advice can come up with a legislative framework. It gets debated in a parliament and the parliamentarians need to understand the significance of what their, their uh, its legislation is and have an understanding. Now, we know how that works. They get briefed. And so we need they to be staff, able to give them. You know, you're supposed to we go on, to be, you know, the yeah. staff is supposed to do their bloody job. And if the staff isn't doing their bloody job, they should get kicked in the pants like everybody else who has a job. Yeah. And, you know, I think if do, you, do we, it, as, an, as, as an industry, we need to really articulate some of these points in a better way if the message isn't getting through. Well, you know, like I think in any industry, in any business, in anything in the world, you know, you have to, you know, who you ask the question to 
really conditions the answer you're going to get. Mm. You know, I, I myself have you know, been, I've been working in this industry probably six years now. And because of my own particular interests, I focused on the legal side of the question. Unfortunately, I had to look at the technological side as well. <laughs> that's, that's harder for me. Um, and I just wasn't, wasn't able to get a clear understanding because even the legal professionals, whether they're in the academic sphere or in the, we'll call them private practice, the commercial sphere, um, they're not making this distinction. Most of them because they're basically scared to death because there is this legislative void that exists. Mm. But on the other hand, you know, I, I'm gonna speak for the US more than for Europe. You know, the US has signaled, even though not explicitly, that they understand Bitcoin, Ethereum, decentralized, sufficiently decentralized, to use uh, Mr. Hinneman's ter term, you know, it's, it's a different animal. It doesn't fall under the SEC. It falls under the CFTC, uh, Commodities Futures Trading. Mm -hmm. um, but not for the, sp the spot market, only for the futures market. And the fact that they haven't wanted to have an ETF for the spot market is, it's like, thank God. <laughs> it's like, okay, you, know, you don't want to create that kind of concentration in this market. You don't want, you know, some bank, some financial institution to have an ETF that, you know, could create all those dysfunctions that you mentioned before, whether they be on a delegated proof of stake or you know, even on a mm. uh, centralized exchange. You just don't want that because then you get that big fat thumb on the scale. That, you know, and I know that there's been a lot of pressure from the uh, a lot of commercial ventures to have a spot ETF that, you know, so far the answer has been no. And, you know, that's a signal that, you know, they haven't, un they understand. Europe, it's a little iffy as far as I can tell, but I don't know. Maybe you can speak to that more than I can. Europe's interesting. They've, there is, there's um, one school of thought is that this is a whole innovative space. They should really back it. They should encourage it. It's an opportunity. So Europe missed out on chip building, artificial intelligence, cloud more or less. IoT, they have a bit of share, but they don't want to miss this party completely. But there's also the other side of it that look at this as a particularly on some of the political spectrum as a, as a big libertarian experiment that one's shutting down if you're more a of a collective mindset. So there's all a lot of turbulence, I think, while we figure this question out. Do we want innovation? Do we want it in this space? Do we want to back this? Or do we want to control it all centrally? You're being really polite. <laughs> I was being as diplomatic as I could, <laughs> as knowing this is a podcast. As you possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been a lot harder. So thank you very much for taking <laughs> for taking that responsibility off my shoulders. <laughs> uh, but yes, I think at the end of the day, you know, there are risks. You know, the I think fundamentally doesn't matter where you are in the world. You know, the reason why there's been so much attention to this technology is that you know, wherever you're coming from, you can see that there's some benefit you can derive from it. Mm -hmm. you know, in, in some of my more radical discussions, like, you know, this is the end of the corporation. You know, we're going to disintermediate the corporation because we just don't need the, co the type of coordination or the level of coordination that the corporation provides in order to provide these goods and services that are manufactured or mm. provided. You know, that, that's my, my, my crazy her heretic uh, move there. 
um, you know, it's very easy to go from what would be considered a distributed, you know, globalized distributed company to a networked company. But you don't need shareholders, you don't need anything, you just have different, different markets for different processes that you have in your company, and then you just connect them amongst themselves and you make other things. It's fine. Um, but the problem is that you don't have the throughput in order to do that in a distributed and decentralized manner. It's just not fast enough. You don't have enough volume to be able to do that. So a lot of answers have been, you know, let's reduce the number of nodes so that we can go faster, or let's make little compromises so that we can go faster. Unfortunately, when you make those compromises, you are no longer allowing the market to signal its pricing properly and fluctuate properly. So you end up in a situation where you have to have some kind of regulation to make sure that the markets are fair. There is, there is another option. If you look at Cosmos and the internet of blockchains, each one of those could be one of those layers. They're producing what they need to do. They interact through IBC from one chain mm -hmm. to another. They add value, they accrue value, then they self-regulate. That's another mm -hmm. approach without compromise. Yeah. Too much on speed and security because each sovereign blockchain can handle things in their own way. Sure. And, you know, that, but I don't know what the throughput is for that. But I imagine that so far it's not fast enough to be able to uh, make a bottle of water. Yeah. Mm. Not yet. No. I mean, 10,000 transactions per second, multiply that up by a number of blockchains of 100, 150. That's quite some throughput. But mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's not near um, what we have in, in cloud computing land which is hugely more, um, but that comes at the cost of centralization. Right. But yeah, you know, like I said, I think everybody said, sees that this is, you know, call it web three if you like, but you know, you get to, you had the first wave of the internet that started to disintermediate certain actors, certain information gatekeepers the second wave that disintermediated some other ones, third wave, it's going to disintermediate some others. And there'll probably yeah. be a fourth and fifth and whatever. But, you know, if we don't start thinking about, you know, how our, we'll call it means of production for lack of a better word, is going to be influenced by this technology, whether it be the banking industry, the services industry, the manufacturing industry, um, well, our, our corporations are going to be buggered because someone's going to come along and say, hey, I can do this in a much more efficient way using this technology, and I'm just going to compete you out of existence. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting close to saying bad things about the EU, so I'm going to stop here. <laughs> the ones you so diplomatically said. <laughs> I think it's um I think you're onto something there. I also think what we're possibly underestimating as well is the power of open source. So we've seen it being used in the software land. Open source designs have massive potential. You couple that with blockchain about rights management, what we were talking about before about yeah, licensing. And so previously your IP gets captured into a company, you produce your widget, that's your competitive advantage until your competitors figure out how to reverse engineer and copy you. But you have a bit of grace time, in which case you're innovating again. If collectively we start sharing more on open source and then we figure out the licensing and we've got all these fancy 3D printers and CNC machines all over the world, we can start really disintermediating all that distribution network. So. I don't need to go and get something that's, you know, a parts manufacturer does in one country, ships it to another, assembled in another, added value along the way as a paint shop here, whatever. You just 
as a local guy does it, cuts it out. It's got a CNC machine, plugs into the open source software, downloads the design, royalty gets paid. That's, I think, really couple that with the blockchain to manage some of these transactions and then the, the royalty tracking and so on. That's where it really starts kicking in. I'm, I'm, I will agree with you. And I just, uh, I, I will echo your sentiment and say that you're going from ex, a, a world of extractive manufacturing to one of additive manufacturing. Correct. But it's not just manufacturing, it's what? We'll call it extractive pro uh, production to additive production. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. way I like to look at it. It's yeah. you know, you're, you know, even from a, we'll call it a, an economic and legal perspective. You know, I unfortunately have this conversation all the time, but when people talk about capitalism, they're like, okay, you know, you're trying to maximize profit. I'm like, no. Everybody's trying to maximize profit. It doesn't matter whether you're a capitalist, a communist, a socialist, it makes no difference because your productive asset only has a certain life expectancy. And during that life expectancy, you have to make it as productive as possible. And if you look at a patent that's worth, you know, that's good for 25 years, well, you know, you got to get a 4% productivity rate out of that. Hmm. If you don't, it's going to fall into the public domain and probably even before then is going to be competed out of existence anyway. When you're a capitalist, because it's your capital, you tend to be more focused on getting that productivity gain out of it than if you're a socialist because you're looking to create jobs, They're crappy jobs, but you know, you're creating jobs and making sure you get reelected. Sorry, I'm being bad again, excuse me. Um, but you know, it doesn't matter what your political and economic system is. Whereas when you're looking at something like a blockchain, you know, just Bitcoin alone, you know, it's supposed to last for hundreds of years. <laughs> it's like you can't use the same mentality, you can't use the same extractive uh, approach, even from a legal perspective, as you would with traditional manufacture or pr traditional production. As well yeah. as the fact that, you know, if I'm working for a smart contract and only paying you know, whatever it is that I need to pay, whatever value I've created, I keep for myself. I'm not splitting it with my employer. Mm -hmm. So the, the regulator or the legislator has to be aware of the fact that you know, it's not only what the tokens are or how you want to define them or their end use, because you know, someone's going to come up with something new anyway, and they're just going to have to tack it on to their legislation, which is going to take them donkey's years to begin with. Yeah. But it's also a fundamental change in your, in your economy and how, how you guys. actually produce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's that brings much, me nice for me. That's a much more interesting thing to look at. Brings me nicely onto DAOs. One one token we haven't really talked about is governance tokens. How that that's all quite true, but we're running out of time. That's going to have are... to wait for another discussion. But yeah. I will thank you for participating in this one, and I look forward to you participating in new ones because this was a good conversation. I did enjoy it, and I hope our the uh, watchers, viewers, and listeners will enjoy it well. I hope, Chris, I didn't muck this up too badly. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank I you. I really enjoyed, enjoyed it as well. I did. Yeah, it was been yeah. good.